right, let's get this party started. Good to see everybody. Gordon, I'm really delighted. I know you have some great topics to share with us. I always like the guest speaker to kind of talk about your background and yeah. where you started and all the way up to what you're doing today, some of your consulting uh, projects. And I'll just turn it over to you, but welcome. Welcome, Gordon. Got, got Excellent, excellent. And just uh, just curious, how many people have been on a cruise here? Raise your hands. How many people have actually been? Okay, so that's about right. Just so you know, about 25% of Americans will ever take a cruise. Three quarters won't for whatever reason it might be. So that's just some of the opportunities there in that category. But a little bit about me. Um, grew up in Wisconsin, so diehard. Cheesehead and Packer fan and Bucks fan and Brewers fan. Don't hold that against me. But went out west, went to, I was, I studied industrial engineering at Stanford and um, got into marketing because my first job was options trading and uh, did some options trading, market crashed. And so I had to find a new job and transitioned through a, a, a professor who recommended me. So it was really about networking and helped me get into Hewlett Packard in marketing, then went to business school, then went to Leo Burnett advertising. And from there went to Disney. So I spent most of my career at the Walt Disney company, 18 years and another seven years at Princess. So I spent most of my career marketing. And so this focus on, since you're all in this esteemed cruise class will be about cruise marketing and several aspects that you may or may not know. Now I'm curious, uh, Professor Fred, or maybe you guys know, I mean, if, if, if you're looking at the folks here in terms of aspirations, I'm curious, what are people thinking? Are some people, let's just, let me just throw something out there. How many people think that they would enjoy if you look at their career to be like a general manager at a hotel? Is that something that people think is interesting? Raise your hand, students, if you want to do like a no. general manager at a hotel or resort. No. How many people are interested in getting into hospitality in some regard? Raise your hand. Okay. So there is that. And then within hospitality, how many people are interested maybe in working at uh, maybe a corporate headquarters of a company within hospitality, helping out in some area? It could be finance, could be marketing, could be general management. Is that what people are interested in? Some of that maybe? Not sure. So how many of you aren't exactly sure what you want to do? And that's okay, because I still don't know what I want to do. <laughs> A few of you. That's cool. All right. So you never know where life's going to pit at you. The one thing I will tell you in terms of some advice is just, you know, the, your networking is so important. Your network is so critical. All of you can support each other. Um, LinkedIn is such a great tool. After this session, feel free to link in to me. You can find me, Gordon Ho, Disney, Gordon Ho Princess, or just I'm under Gordon K. Ho, because you never know who can help you out, your alumni, et cetera, because nowadays finding that job in your career is likely due to networking. And even at Disney, I got the job because of a, a fellow alum from Kellogg, my business school, who didn't know, but I sent her a letter and she said, hey, it looks pretty good. And then at Princess Cruises, it was a fellow colleague at Disney who knew the hiring boss, the president for business school. So pretty much most of my jobs have come from a referral. And so that's the power of a network. So one piece of advice, which isn't necessarily tied to cruising or hospitality, okay? Um, but uh, I'll, let me bring up a slide to show you a little bit more. Hold on, let me share slide, share screen. Okay, can somebody, Professor, can you see the slide? Yes, I should. All righty. All right, guys, here we go. I'm gonna go through this and this will, we'll try to make this engaging. And so on my left, this is what I did at Disney. Again, most of my career, 18 years, has been at Disney, mostly in the studios, home entertainment group. Uh, big thing that uh, I'm very proud of that my team and I were able to launch was the first direct-to-video movie, Return of Jafar. Now a lot of movies are going direct to home. Back then it was controversial, but of course now things are going direct to Netflix, Disney Plus, HBO Max. Had the great pleasure of working on various franchises from Winnie the Pooh to High School Musical to Lion King to Lost, Desperate Housewives, you name it. And then... Um, Work on just a lot of fun creation stuff, like the Finding Nemo Virtual Aquarium, working with that with John Laster and the creative team, or the Disney Vault, our loyalty program, Disney Movie Rewards. Many of you who go into hospitality, your loyalty program is going to be a critical part of your, of your ability to drive business. And then many technologies and platforms for distribution as seen on the lower left bottom. On the right, these are some of the things that, um, again, my team and I were able to launch and work on, whether it's improving your sleep at the Prince's Luxury Bed, culinary programs like chocolate, working with Curtis Stone on fine dining, mixologists, and in terms of entertainment, working with the esteemed Stephen Schwartz. He's the guy who did Wicked and Pippin and Godspell, partnering with him to create exclusive Broadway musicals only on our ship. And we'll talk about some other partnerships as well. All right. So if you have any questions about any of these experiences, feel free to jot it down or ask me now or ask me later at the end, okay? okay. Now, these are some of the topics that we'll talk about. I'll give you a little breath of some of the fun stuff that you could do if you choose a career in marketing at, at uh, a cruise line, uh, launching a new branding, partnerships and guest experiences, technologies. I know you had, I think it was Ted Knight who gave you yeah. an overview of Ocean Medallion. So I'm going to touch upon the marketing of it. Ted was actually part of my sales team when I was at Princess. Crisis communications, which you never want to deal with, but you have to be prepared with. And then we'll have some Q&A. All right. So, guys, in the world of, of marketing or anything we deal with, this is a reality. Media and product fragmentation. You guys have more choice, we all do, than ever before, right? You all remember back in the days of television, we used to only watch three or four channels. Now you have hundreds of channels on television, not to mention social channels, Twitch, all that stuff that has content. It's really an amazing time. You have whatever you want, whenever you want. It's, it's, it's amazing. At the same time, how do you break out? 
One thing that I'll leave you with is a, a theme is something that the author Seth Godin talks about, which is a purple cow. I grew up in Wisconsin. These cows here are Holstein cows. They're dairy cattle, except for that purple one. And if I saw a purple cow, I would stop, pause, take a picture and say, is that thing real? And I think the lesson here is how do you make a purple cow? So whatever you do in your business, whatever you pursue, if you're launching a service, a product experience, think about if it's a purple cow, because nowadays you need to be remarkable in order to set yourself apart from all the clutter. Okay. Now, let me tell you about the rebrand of Princess Cruises when I first came into Princess in 2013. Let me tell you a little bit about what Princess was like at the time and still largely is. De on the left, it's a destination cruise line. It's known for a cruise line that goes all around the world, whether it's Alaska, they're number one there, the Panama Canal, South America, Asia, around the world. We have cruises over 100 days where we literally take you around the world, okay? And then in the middle, we have, uh, we're known as an authentic, premium, and relaxing cruise line. Authentic in the sense that we bring you authentic experiences like in Alaska, the park rangers will come aboard and teach the kids about things. We uh, innovated the idea of movies under the stars, basically an outdoor movie theater on the top deck. Relaxing in the middle, the sanctuary is an outdoor only relaxing retreat. And on the bottom, we had Sabatini's original Italian restaurant, and then we pioneered balcony dining where you could eat privately in your own balcony that we would bring, almost like room service in your balcony. And on the right, you can see some of the original shows. Uh, we were known for some original content that we would create programming as well as uh, romance, where we are known as the Love Boat. Some of you may have seen reruns of the Love Boat. Professor Fred may tell you about the Love Boat, very popular TV show in the 70s and 80s one of the top ones and it, the love boat was filmed on the Princess Cruises. So a lot of people still remember the love boat and all the, the cast of that show. This is what we were competing with um, in terms of other cruise lines, the top other three cruise lines. We, Princess is the number three largest cruise line. This is Royal is one, Norwegian is, no, Royal is two, Norwegian's three, four, Carnival's one. Royal Caribbean, this is what they have. You could learn to, to surf on their wave rider. They have this outdoor theater where these divers dive into a pool from 100 feet in the air. Norwegian has a full-scale water park with uh, SpongeBob and Nickelodeon characters. They also have this go-kart at sea on the top deck. And on the right, you see Carnival again, dueling water slides. And they have this thing called the Sky Ride, where you actually, this it's amazing thing, you, you pedal around the top of the ship. So here's a question. How do you compete with this exciting hardware? Because hardware like that is very visual. It's exciting. It's easy to share on social media. How do you own a unique positioning that utilizes our strengths? So knowing Princess Cruises didn't quite have that hardware that you saw from those other three. Any thoughts from folks? And you could just just speak up or professor, I can't see everybody on the screen. So maybe you can decide how you want to write. But does anybody have any input on how would you try to compete with these other three cruise lines, given the hardware is very marketable? Any thoughts? Anybody? Maybe like strength. Emily, um, Emily in the classroom. You can let Megan go first. OK, Megan, you go okay. first and answer. Maybe. Um, maybe strengthen what you already have. So maybe if like dining is already great, like strengthen the dining mm. more or something like that. Yeah, that's good. How, strengthen, how would you strengthen the dining? What, what would be an idea, Megan, you do? How do you strengthen your dining? Um, from my experiences on cruises, maybe like giving some sort of like sample to guests that are okay. going or some sort of promotion to yeah. make people want to go. Okay, good. Okay, Emily? Yeah, I was gonna say just like finding where like Princess already has a strong market and then like really targeting that market segment because all of that stuff that like the other cruises were offering, maybe not everybody's gonna like be into the big like water slides and go-karts at sea and like would rather have something more relaxing or something like that. So you can target those specific markets that aren't as interested in things that you don't have. Very good. Now it's a good point. It's like, don't have to chase the colorful stuff necessarily. Focus on what you have that could 
could you and lean into it? Good point. Good point. Well, that's, anybody else? Those are great, great responses. Anybody? Um, I think forming alliance alliances with brands yeah. like say like Guy Fieri or. Yeah. That's a good setup. That's a good setup. So let's let's, let's continue. Um, well, for one of the things that we did was we did our homework, right? So whatever you do, I'm a big fan of data, data that can drive insights and actionability. So you can see some of the things that we did, interviews, focus groups, talk to travel agents, many, many people looked at Google Analytics, what people are researching on our site, what people are searching on Google, right? There's a lot of tools for you to do. Look on Google Trends. A lot of ways for you to get a sense of what the market is like, okay? Here's some of the comments from the focus groups we did. Travel is mind expanding. That's why I love it. When I travel, I want to maximize my experiences. I want to do things I haven't done and see things I haven't seen. And we realize, okay, here's some of the assets that Princess has. Our itineraries have set the standard. This is the Panama Canal. We believe children should discover, not disappear. A lot of times, like in a, if you have a ship with a water park, the kids will go run off and you don't hang out with them. And some parents are cool with that. Other parents say, wait, 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 I work so hard. I want to spend time with my kids. We design our ships so people can see the sky. So pretty much because 80% of our ships are balconies and we try not to block your view, you can see the skies from where you are. We host more people in Alaska than anyone else. Again, we're number one in Alaska, and the number one way to see Alaska is through a cruise. This is our positioning. Only Princess believes a cruise isn't good enough unless you come back new. Okay, that's what we thought, is that when you go on a Princess cruise, you will come back refreshed, a different person, new perspective. But how do we know if this is valid? So we said, hey, let's write a concept in kind of plain language. Right, Print Brand Y Cruises, which is us, offers beautiful scenery, brand new experiences, fresh perspectives that can change you for the better. We offer more ports and more cities, bring the cultures of your destinations on board our ships so you can come back new. So we tested this concept versus the concepts of the other cruise lines and we wrote out concepts that we felt reflected it based on their website and so forth. And we found that there was huge lift in consideration, meaning this is the cruise line I would like to go with after they read the concept for Princess. So we knew we had something. We actually even tested some video reels that we put together. And so then we said, okay, let's lean into this campaign and create a marketing campaign behind this. And you can see the Princess promise. Uh, we promise to inspire you, to relax your body and mind and reconnect you to those you love, to immerse you in destinations near and far, awaken your curiosity around the world, around you. We promise that when you return home, you return not with suitcases full of souvenirs, but with memories that are everlasting. Above all, we promise you'll come back new. What do you guys think? You guys like that? Don't like it? Any good? Ah, uh, Professor Fred likes it. I saw his up thumbs up. And I think this, we leaned into this at a good time because remember, there's been a big transition from buying things to getting experiences, right? I think more and more people value experiences. And I think social media has helped driven this whole wanderlust, this whole concept of travel is what you want to do and experience life. Here's some of our ads. The greatest show is Earth. You can see this one, Ex explore, restore, repeat. So again, the whole idea of explore, but also restore your spirit, restore your sense of connection to the world, relax. And what will be your greatest discovery, which is on the right. And let me see if I can play one of these spots, see if this works. Bear with me. Maybe it'll work. She won't remember this, being carried in your arms. But after a morning spent in the Caribbean, playing pirates with you in secret coves, an afternoon swimming with dolphins, finished with a movie watched against the setting sun, she won't exactly be short on memories. Princess Cruises. Come back new. So those are one of our launch spots. Let me play you another spot that talks about what Professor Fred hinted at, which was the um... Hi, this is Connor. Sorry I missed you. 
I'm either away from my desk or on another call. Please leave a message and I'll get back to you just as soon as I'm available. Thank you for your patience at this busy time. Join us for stargazing with Discovery at Sea. Enjoy cruises from $4.99 during our 50th anniversary sale. Call your travel consultant or 1-800-PRINCESS. Princess Cruises. Come back new. All right. So let me get back to the presentation for you. All right. So you just saw two of our commercials. Any thoughts from folks? Any feedback? I've got uh, I've got some thoughts for you. I think that's fantastic. All Good. the research that that I've kind of you know done, and because uh, I, I do enjoy the idea of boating and and being out at sea and that sort of thing. And what seems to be a, a bigger trend in recent times, and definitely looking into the future, is is the idea behind expeditions. You know, boats that can go to places that people have never been before and being able to open that up to as many people as possible and coming back new, having these experiences. I think that plays right into what the market is showing it wants to do. Yeah. So I like it. Good. Good. Any other thoughts from people? I, uh, we have Emily in the classroom. So oh, I'm going to spin good. the camera I'm around. forward in my little wheelie chair. Go ahead, Emily. Uh, I was just going to say, I, I really liked the incorporation of the sort of technology cleanse that was also referenced there with the, like, you know, missed voicemail thing playing in the background that, yeah. you know, says, you know, put down your phone and really start to experience the world. I think that's something yeah. that will speak to a lot of people, especially uh, cruising people, because it is so much like, completely detaching from like the mainland and everything, all the technology that kind of holds yeah. you there. Yeah, you're right. In fact, uh, that's one of my favorite spots was the stargazing commercial because it's the idea of like, hey, voicemails will continue to happen, but you know what? Put a, put a voicemail saying you're doing something important, which is finding yourself, connecting with nature and stars. And I think that's, a, that's an important thing. In fact, I'll tell you about that commercial. The U.S. Travel Association, which I don't know if you're familiar with, it's a body that it's their whole goal is to uh, drive vacations and travel both in the U.S. and international tourism into the U.S. And one of the things that they found was that a lot of Americans were not using their vacation. Most Americans, I think, let 40, 30, 40, 50 percent of their vacation, uh, they don't use it. So they wanted to do a campaign to get people to take their vacations because they know how it improves productivity, helps with family connection. And they liked our commercial so much. They asked, they, they called me up and said, Gordon, we'd like permission to use your commercial as one of our commercials to promote taking your vacation. And so we got a lot of uh, additional PR because of that spot. So um, anyway, let's keep going. So in addition to advertising, we, our brochures. A lot of people, before they go on a vacation, they want to read a brochure. Uh, you would think we would get rid of paper brochures. We certainly have reduced them, but they're still very valuable to certain segments. And of course, we try to use Come Back New and, and promote destinations there. We actually integrated into our sales. So when you have limited time sales, you we had a Come Back New sale to also link back into the theme of the campaign. And we had comeback new moments. We had the hashtag comeback new. We asked people to share on Instagram and so forth their comeback new moments. And we were able to then live feed it into our website. So that, again, to create this wanderlust moment onto this. Now, our positioning was compelling, but still competing with the hardware was still difficult. What are some things we could do? And I'll, I'll let you know, Pro the Professor Fred kind of hinted at this in terms of alliances and partnerships. And so I'm just going to go right into this. And basically say that, look it, and you you guys talked about it. How do we make our food maybe better? I think, uh, talk about whether it's sampling and so forth. I think when you look at what people wanted in a cruise and with Princess, we looked at all the data. We looked at what drove Net Promoter Score. I, I don't know if you know what NPS is, but Net Promoter Score, of course, is the percent. When you ask people from zero to 10, rate how likely you are to recommend this hotel or this cruise line to somebody else. If somebody recommends you at a nine or 10, that's considered a promoter, okay? If somebody rates you a zero, one, two, three, four, five, or 
or five. Yeah, I think that's zero through five. That's considered uh, a negative. I think six, seven, eight is considered neutral. It may be just seven and eight is neutral. But what you do is you take your promoters, percentage of promoters, subtract it from your uh, the negatives, and that's your net promoter score. And you actually can have a negative net promoter score. Um, but there are companies like Netflix that have a very high net promoter score. Princess in general has a very good promoter, net promoter score on a 50. And um, But when you looked at net promoter scores, what drives it? Negative experiences around food or entertainment or something's wrong with their room. Let's say it smelled or maybe there's a leak in the toilet. That's what's going to screw you over. And these are some of the things that they look forward to. Um, and so how do we make that better? And so when when if Carnival has dueling water slides, or if Royal Caribbean has people diving in an outdoor deck, how do we lean into what we do and how do we make it better? And this is where we said, you know what, let's make our product better. So on the left, to make our, our food stand out more, we did partnerships with a lot of chefs, including Curtis Stone, where he was the hottest chef in LA around 2013-14. I told you about Stephen Schwartz, who has made uh, Pippin, Godspell, uh, and uh, Wicked, and ha we work with him and say, hey, could you make your next Broadway musicals on Princess? And he said, yes. Uh, I'm a big fan of the Weston Heavenly Bed. So we said, can we do that for Princess? Can we create our own bed and make it great so people have the best relaxation and sleep at sea? So we actually partnered with a sleep doctor who worked with us to create a bed, and he's awesome. And then the right, we'll talk about this. We work with Discovery to improve our exp our our experiences abroad um, in terms of destinations and on board. So what do you think are some of the benefits of a Princess Discovery partnership? What do you guys think? Any thoughts? What are things that do you think could be good for Princess or Discovery if we were to do an alliance? And on the bottom are some of the shows that are on Discovery or Animal Planet, for example. Yeah. Anybody? Certainly uh, cross-marketing, cross-promotional, yeah. be one. Yeah. Anything what else? else? Students? What do you think would be good to do? What would you try? If you knew that we could do a partnership with Discovery, which includes Animal Planet, the Learning Channel, number of things. What about uh, some of the things that you get to see in the Discovery Channel shows? I mean, half of them are, you know, some sort of fishing, right? Like a deadliest catches on there, or uh, so I'm, I would think of like some sort of like small experience that you guys could do that that would bring someone to you know quote unquote into their favorite show. Yeah, I, that's a good point. Uh, is that William? Willie. Yes, Willie. Correct. Willie. Yes. That's a good point. It's like, hey, you've seen these shows. Now you can experience them or immerse yourself in them. Right. And there's a lot of talk about that. How do you have more immersive experiences now? Right. I think like Marvel, you see a big bet from Disney. They're going to launch the whole Marvel land and California adventure, just like they've invested in Star Wars and the world of Avatar. And think about Harry Potter. Harry Potter alone raised the attendance at Universal theme parks by 20 plus percent when they launched the world of Harry Potter because people want to immerse yourself in the world that you fell in love with on television or movies. Huge trend. All right, well, we'll just, we'll move on. So here's one of the things that, let's say you guys are working in a cruise line, an airline, a hotel, and you wanna do a partnership. It could be a local partnership. It could be the local restaurant down the street, who knows? But one of the things that you do is, is you gotta negotiate. So. On the left, we quickly identified, here's some common interests. We wanna grow awareness and interest for both brands. We wanna expand our audiences together. Discovery has an audience, we have an audience. How do we work together to grow our audiences together? We wanna to create experiences on ship and shore. We want an exposure across all our touch points. Discovery has all their channels. We have, of course, a large direct mail and email database. On the right, these are some of the things that were more variable. Princess, right? How much money do we have to pay to use the rights for Discovery properties? Paid media Discovery wants us to advertise on all their networks. They said, hey, we want you to spend millions of dollars on our networks. Well, we don't, we want the rights to not have to if it doesn't work. Uh, 
And of course, how much do we have to invest in capital? Discovery, we asked them, could you give us free on-air exposure across your networks? Of course, they don't wanna to commit too much. And how about access to your talent? Can we get the Mythbusters to go on our ship? And as you know, talent is sometimes difficult to work with. And sometimes they can't control them or tell them to do something. So here's just some of the things that we did and we'll get into it, but it's, it's and you mentioned, I think Willie, Deadliest Catch, Springing Deadliest Catch, uh, Animal Planet Tours and Stargazing. So one of the things we did in terms of sh our shore excursions is we said, let's make exclusive Discovery Animal Planet shore excursions. So we went to the tour operators who do tours for multiple cruise lines. We said, how would you like to do something unique just for Discovery Animal Planet? And we were pleasantly surprised when almost all of them said we would love to do that because it would help our brand and it let us charge more money. And you can see some of these exclusive tours that were created. I'll just tell you the one on the right where you see people taking pictures of the whale tail. We actually had these high powered cameras. We gave it to the kids in Alaska and they would take pictures of the whale's tails. A whale's tail, if you don't know, is like a fingerprint. It is a unique kind of image that identifies a whale. Each whale has unique pattern on their tail. And when the kids take this picture, they then compare that digital image into photos that are in on the boat. And they could quickly identify, oh, that's Gordon the whale or that's Fred the whale. And it really brings the whole boat together. The kids are participative and it's a real great way to connect and something that was an Animal Planet exclusive that we did. Of course, we also had Deadliest Catch tours and we also had recommended tours. When we couldn't do exclusive tours, we had the stamp of approval from Animal Planet and Discovery. And in all, we had over 800 tours. We ended up winning uh, tours of the year by Cruise Credit and other magazines. So this was a huge, huge partnership and yielded a lot of great results for us. On board, we did things like stargazing. You saw the commercial. We actually brought Hakim Olusehi, who is the Science Channel host. He also works for NASA to narrate our stargazing thing. So we put recordings, people wore these headsets, and then the uh, our Discovery Ambassador would use a laser pointer to point out things. So you would be listening on your headset to uh, Dr. Hakim talking about what was above you. And we had to do various recordings because the ships were in different hemispheres. So the stars, of course, would have different placements based on where the ships were. For some of you who are aware of this show, this is Pete Nelson. He hosts a show called Treehouse Masters. He makes the most amazing tree houses in the backyard or wherever of, of famous people. It's, 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 it's crazy. And we thought it would be great to do a tree house in Alaska. It was the very first one he ever did. It took us three years to plan, but we finally did it. We did it in the McKinley Princess Hotel site. Princess owns Alaska hotels in order for people to get off the ship and go inland into Alaska. So we built our own hotels. We needed to refresh one of our hotels, the McKinley Princess with something new. So we built a tree house there using um, Pete Nelson's team. And it became, we, it was, um, they, li they liked the episode so much. They said, we're going to make this our season finale. They called it the finale and Denali. We promoted it through all our email lists and it became their number one rated episode of the season. And uh, it was great. Now, not only did they get great exposure, we got great exposure. And now people are telling us they want to stay at McKinley Princess because they want to go visit the tree house that was created on this Animal Planet show. These are the kid centers we did. We updated the kid centers. This was a decent amount of capital. So this took a, a while to do, but we started to refresh our kid centers around um, Camp Discovery. And so we have different kid centers depending on the age, uh, the youngest on the upper right, the teenagers on the lower left, but we were able to bring elements of the show, whether it's Shark Week or Animal Planet, depending on the age of the kids. So here's a question for you guys. What do you think are some of the metrics we can use to, to measure the success of discovery? How would you decide? So we had to pay some money to discovery for the partnership. We invested in creating these experiences. How would you ultimately assess if this partnership was worth it or not? Any ideas on what you could do? What metrics might you look at? Guys, any thoughts? Maybe somebody that hasn't spoken. Um, I can cold call somebody. You yeah, want me to do that? There, see if they're awake. Go ahead, Gordon. So all be, right. this is really a, not a hard question. Daisy. Daisy. All right, Daisy. A good choice. What do you think, Daisy? What are some things you might look at to see if this was a good partnership? 
um, to see how many people like actually booked the cruise to go on these like this with like the discovery. Mm -hmm. How would you do that? How would you know how many people booked the cruise because of discovery? How would you how would you understand? How would you get at well, that number? Are these cruises like just like with discovery? Like, are you just being like, you know what I mean? Like, it's just like you're doing so, all the discovery cruises, not like. No, 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 no. Good question, Daisy. All of the Princess Cruises had the Discovery at Sea program. Right. Oh, so so when okay. you're in Europe, when you're in Europe, we had discovery tours in Europe. When you're in Alaska, you had deadliest catch. Okay. When you're in the Panama Canal, you could see the sloth sanctuary. So the the, the, the the exact elements would differ. But each cruise had discovery at sea tours. Mm -hmm. They had stargazing. They all had it. So so, so I you have to like go and book that certain thing when you like book the cruise, like you're booking like an excursion basically, you know what no, I mean? That's right, Daisy. So that's one way to look at, are more people booking the discovery excursions versus mm -hmm. other excursions? That's yeah. a great point. That is correct. That's one of the metrics we use. That's, that's true. true. That is true. Anybody else? I'm gonna keep going. You're, next to you is Katerina. Katerina, what would you do? How would you assess if the discovery partnership was worthwhile or not? I don't know. What? The only, this is probably, does, probably doesn't make any sense, but I was thinking like a way to find out if the guests wanted to go on the cruise for the Discovery Partnership is maybe have some kind of survey for the guests. Yeah. Like no. a questionnaire. Absolutely. Like we would do surveys after guests would cruise. We would ask, we would do, remember I told you the net promoter score. We would ask them about their net promoter score. We would ask them, would you recommend it? And then we would ask them about elements of the program that they look forward to. And that's something definitely we would ask. So yes, Katerina, that's actually a good point. You can actually include a question about discovery on the survey after the fact. And you could even do it ahead of time too. Anybody else? I'm going to keep going on the right. One more. Who's next? Let's see on my list. Who's next on the thing? Julie, you're on my screen next. Sorry, you're the next person. What do you think, Julie? What might you do to assess discovery? My idea was actually that survey, like asking, why did you book this cruise? What was your primary intention? And was it for discovery? Was it for like the location? Um, that was the one right. that I dealt with. So we already talked about it. Right. But no, I think it's important. The key is, guys, when you do investments in anything, if you're going to recommend something, after you do it, people are going to want to know if it works, right? You have to show an ROI, and that could be through surveys. There's other things that I'll talk about, but I, I've cold called three people. Does anybody want to volunteer before we move on? Any other metrics that they yeah. think that maybe have not been said? Yeah, I'm always. I was going to say just like generally comparing it to like historical data and like historical bookings mm -hmm. and revenue and um, metrics like that, that might not be as specific, but might still show if like you're getting a lot more bookings or things like that. Yeah, that's good. That's a good point. The hard part might be, let's say you saw lift in bookings. How do you attribute it to discovery? Right. This is this is something that's often hard at attribution, attribution of marketing, attribution of programs. How would you know if discovery caused a lift in sales if there was a lift in sales? Yeah, I think that's a great point. Also, uh, do they return, you know, because yeah. of this? How many repeat customers, lifetime value of a customer? Right. And then so, again, if there's more loyalty, the question is, I guess you could do, to Professor's point, if somebody took a Discovery Tour or Animal Planet Tour, are those people have a higher repeat rate than somebody who didn't take an Animal Planet or Discovery Tour, right? All right. So let's keep going. I got a question for you. Yes, sir. Um, as far as this, maybe some of the metrics you might want to look at, age demographics, something I'm thinking about for this discovery partnership is, and maybe a reason why something like this would be really good for, for a cruise that you guys are doing at Princess, is because when people are tuning into Discovery, it's not just, you know, it's not the Disney Channel. It's not like the entertainment network, right, where it's not just people. It's something that a family can sit down and enjoy because yeah. who doesn't love nature, right? So I guess what I'd be what I'd be getting at is, is to maybe double check to make sure that any of these sort of excursions don't lean too much towards any one demographic, right? Because if it's 
if it leans heavier on things that parents are interested in, but their six year old can't grasp the concepts, yeah. the parents aren't coming back because the kids don't want to be there. Yeah, I think ultimately, remember, if you saw Willie, 800 tours, we had plenty, we had different, but they think they had to link into what we thought were discovery or animal planet elements. So animal planet obviously had to tie into animals or nature. For discovery, we had more flexibility because the discovery channel is pretty broad, right? So you could maybe right. do a tour of a museum, but what's that interactive discovery element about the museum, right? You know, is it like the Knights of Templar, right? Made famous for the Da Vinci Code. Who knows? I mean, there's no shortage of things you can do. All right. So let me tell you a few things that we did assess. So the, I don't know if you guys know this, but travel advisors are your friend, depending on the type of travel you guys get into. Travel advisors, like in cruising, travel advisors still account for a majority of bookings. They, they are the ones that help book cruisers, partially because booking a cruise can be complicated. Remember, on a cruise, you can say, okay, what deck do you want to be? Deck 15, deck 12, deck 10, deck 8. Do you want to be on the front of the ship, the middle of the ship, the back of the ship. So there's a lot of different points of the, sh the of uh, booking a cabin on a cruise that a travel agent could help you on. So what we did is we showcased Discovery at Sea on what we call the Comeback New Tour, where we included it to say, hey, we are refreshing our ship. We're making our ship come back new. And, and included in that is our Discovery at Sea program. And what we found out by educating these 6,000 travel agents the their perception of princess being a family appropriate cruise line increased 20 percent and it became a top mention by travel advisors so that was one great thing that we learned from the other here are some other things the top web backlinks came from discovery so for those of you who know about google when you search on google type in something let's say you say hey best cruise lines for families google will will serve advertised sites, right? So I, as a, uh, an advertiser, can say, hey, Google, I'm willing to pay for my site to show up on top, but I have to pay Google, say, for $2 a click. After the advertised comes the organic links. How does Google decide who comes up first, second, and third? Well, that's an algorithm. And the Google algorithm determines who comes up first, second, third based on the content on your site, as well as the backlinks. So if a lot of third-party sites are linking back to your site, Google says, huh, a lot of sites tend to like Princess. In this case, Discovery had a lot of links back to Princess because let's say you're looking at an Animal Planet show. They'll say, hey, how would you like to learn about the treehouse on Princess Cruises? And then it links back to Princess. These are very valuable. These backlinks improve what's called the Google quality score. And Google values this such that it will raise your ranking on Google. Does anybody know how important it is to be ranked number one on Google versus number 10? Does it make a difference? What do you think? Everyone's nodding their head, right? Yes, absolutely. It's huge. So, and they call it search engine marketing value, SAM value. So if I have to pay, let's say $3 a click, let me give me an example for the best cruise line for families. Let's say normally I have to pay $3 a click. If I'm organically ranked number one and they click on me, I pay nothing. Like if they pay, if they click on my organic link, which is not my ad, I pay nothing. So essentially I save $3. The number of clicks you get if you're ranked number one is like so much more than if you're ranked number two, three, four, five, six. That's the value of strong, what they call SEO or search engine optimization, okay? And the way you can improve your ranking, one of the ways is to get backlinks. And it turned out that our discovery partnership was huge in driving backlinks, okay? So that's your search engine optimization lesson for the day. All right, let's keep going. Other metrics we looked at, we talked about shore excursions, had higher sales and margins. We also saw more earned in social media. We had a lot of good publicity from uh, the Today Show, Parade, People Magazine. Discovery promoted us on their social media partnerships. And we also had consumers talk a lot about our, our stargazing, et cetera, and our media. So when we advertised on Discovery or Animal Planet shows, we found out that we actually had um, – better response rate because people watching an animal planet show says oh that sounds really cool i might be interested in an animal planet tour on princess 
So now discovery showed us pretty good ROI pretty quickly, but what about something that's a longer term investment? And this is about the ocean medallion, which you heard a little bit about, but you may not have heard. We did a lot of research on what were the friction points that our customers were experiencing. Number one, their top annoyances they said about vacations was waiting in line. They hated wasting time. This is a three hour line to go see the Avatar ride over at uh, Walt Disney World's Animal Kingdom. It's worth it, guys. It's a three hour ride, but it's a great ride. But it's three hours. At least it was way back before the pandemic. What do they think that would be better for their vacations? More time to relax. They don't want to wait in line. And the desired benefits we tested was, yeah, it'd be great if vacations were hassle-free and if I had a VIP experience. So you heard about this. The prince. We launched the uh, Princess Medallion class featuring the Ocean Medallion. We called it the next wave of vacation travel. And just in case, just a reminder, the Ocean Medallion uh, featured the Ocean Medallion wearable, which had near field and Bluetooth technologies. Princess Medallion class also includes 7,000 sensors throughout each ship. We had a mobile app, portal screens on the ship. We had broadband antennas that were added and each crew member had a crew device. The forward facing crew members who dealt with customers had a crew device. So when you walked by them with your medallion, your face would pop up and they would know, oh, that's Gordon Ho or that's Professor Fred. And they would be able to say you by name. They could then wish you happy birthday because your birthday would pop up on that screen. You may have heard these are the, some of the top benefits of the Ocean Medallion and the Princess Medallion class. Faster contactless boarding, truly touchless payment, find your way on board, keyless stateroom entry, locate your friends and family, and whatever you need delivered. Now, sometimes when you look at this, you, you say, oh, okay, that looks interesting, but it's hard to really tell because unlike like the go-kart on the region's cruise ship, this is harder to see visually. Like what is happening? What's the key benefit here? And so part of the challenge is how do you market this? So <clears throat> here, the best Caribbean cruise line just got better. We tried to be very clear is that you get more of the vacation you love. Find out how to get more of what you love. We use influencers to tell the story. This is Vandy Fair. She posed this picture herself. So this is an influencer, came aboard the ship. We gave her a free cruise. And what's great is she has several hundred thousand influencers following her. And, and what's great is that they read whatever she writes. And what she talked about was that, hey, anything you want is delivered to you because of the Ocean Medallion, which is what she's wearing around her neck. And that's, I couldn't even do a better visual if I paid it a, a, an agency to do it. She did a great job. And all this content be, is something she gave to us as well to use. We tried to be simple with our marketing, a bar wherever you are. Because remember, as whenever you had the Ocean Medallion, no matter where you were sitting, essentially you had a virtual bar because you could have a drink delivered to you. And this is some of the personalization that we did, right? Look at our cabin store. Welcome back, Cindy. Thank you for your loyalty because he knew you were a repeat customer. Or uh, this is Isaac from the Love Boat. But basically, Cindy, I believe vodka cranberry is your preferred drink because the bartender knows. Or Cindy, a surprise happy anniversary for you and your husband, John, because again, we know it's your anniversary. We can empower the crew. I now know, this is what the cabin steward told us. I now know when our guests have left the room so I can clean more efficiently. The crew now has better Wi-Fi. So instead of, when we would go to shore, a lot of the crew would go to the internet cafes. They would go to a cafe and do internet to email home and check their own. Now a lot of them would spend more time traveling because they had better Wi-Fi on the ship. So when they saw and explored the world, they actually were happier. Happy crew means happy guests. So ultimately, this is some of the stuff that happened. The Ocean Medallion drove higher satisfaction, spend and repeat visits. The real-time ship data enabled personalized recommendations so we would know, hey, this is a good candidate to sell perfume. And we used the data to deliver personalized content to look alike so we could find other people based on the data we got from the Ocean Medallion to target people for relaxing vacations, be it a Caribbean or maybe an Alaska family vacation or more romantic tour in Europe. And the last thing I'll leave you with though is as technology is as good as it is for driving guest experience, it also can be critical in dealing with a crisis. You may have remembered, this has been a year ago, a little over a year ago, but the very first thing you heard about COVID might've been on our cruise ship in Japan in early February. 
where we announced that 24 Americans are among those infected on the Diamond Princess cruise ship. It was a circus. Look at the media. We had Japanese health officials going aboard, testing people. So what did we do? Our key focus was the health and safety of our guests and our crew. So we supported them. On the upper left, they're testing our, our guests. On the lower left, we had these, what's called these crisis response centers. Thank gosh, we had the broadband that was installed on the ship so we could communicate in real time with the ships. We suddenly had to deliver meals to everybody through room service because we were doing a quarantine now. That's what the Japanese Ministry of Health said was the best thing to do. On the upper right, that's our president, Jan Schwartz. We had to do lots and lots of video content updates to keep the ship informed on what was going on. And we would send these ships, these updates through email, through our in-room channel, through our social media. Uh, we would send them through cabin flyers. And on the lower right, the captain, the captain tried to instill calm by calling the crew, you're my gladiators. In this, in this period of stress, you guys hang in there we will get through this. And he made the reference that a diamond is a lump of, of, of a chunk of coal that does well under pressure. So as you know, diamond is like coal or carbon that is compressed. And so diamond princess, he said, look at guys, we're all diamonds. We're going to get through this crisis and through this stress. Now, a lot of people will say during a crisis or, or, or for a PR crisis, you need to control the message. Well, nowadays it's harder to do because everybody involved in a crisis um, is their own broadcaster. We had people on our ship who were broadcasting uh, on CNN, on MSNBC, because they would be tweeting or doing something on Facebook, and then a reporter would say, hey, I just saw your post. We would like to interview you live in an hour. Are you okay with that? And suddenly these people became famous on CNN and ABC and Good Morning America. The most famous couple was this couple here, Tyler and Rachel Torres, partially because they were on their honeymoon. They were probably the young, one of the younger couples on this cruise. They started a Reddit, uh, Ask Me Anything, and they were posting like literally every hour on what was going on in the ship. And they were interviewed literally twice, three times a day. And I reached out to them and I said, you guys are keeping everybody informed. And I, I want to ask you a favor. In case you find out about any passengers who need something, you know, let us know because we want to be as responsive as possible. And they did such a great job. They would say, hey, Gordon, here's uh, something you need to know about these passengers. You might want to do something. Because remember, some of the passengers didn't want to bother the crew because the crew was very busy with room delivery. They didn't want to clog up the front office phone lines that were being used to respond to people getting sick. But we were still able to support people by watching social media, but also through people like Tyler and Rachel Torres, who did such a good job of communicating to us and the world of what was going on. And by reaching out to them, they became an advocate of Princess because they knew we were doing everything we could to take care of the guests and the crew. We also tried to instill positivity by creating a social media handle, Hang In There Diamond Princess, which became a, a global hashtag. We noticed this was trending in Japanese, so we, we took it for, for an English global handle. On the lower left, you, don't, you may or may not recognize these people. These are the cast members from the TV show Love Boat. That's the captain. That's, his, that's uh, Gavin McLeod and Jill Whelan, who played the father-daughter on the Love Boat. And we had this, uh, it became a global movement where people would say, hang in there, Diamond Princess. And it was very uh, uplifting to the crew and the passengers when they knew that the world was supporting what was going on. But as you, as you may have heard, um, a lot of these people were transported off the ship to serve quarantine on land for another 14 days. And so we set up care teams to work with the military, HHS, CDC, to support the military in the care of our guests. So we did, uh, on the upper left, we actually wrote letters of support. We hand wrote letters to every passenger. Uh, so we had instilled a team. So we, they had personal notes of support. We actually went out there on the lower left to help support when these uh, passengers were released from the military bases. We did care packages. We worked with the military, like on the upper right. You can see what the Captain Steve Fermansky said on the HSS. I tell people that I'll be going on a Princess Cruise. I was so impressed with how you supported operation and took care of the guests. Your service on the ship must be amazing. So an ultimate lesson here is even in a crisis, if you can take care of your guests, support the people helping you, support your passengers, um, 
you'll find, and that, in fact, you'll find that actually a majority of these people uh, have already rebooked a cruise with us, even though they were part of this horrible crisis. So that concludes the, uh, the four chapters. We talked about a new brand campaign, Come Back New, right? We talked about partnerships with uh, Discovery and other partnerships. We talked about the Ocean Medallion technology and how it helped the crew do a better job of servicing them. And then we've caught, we talked about how you can act in a crisis. Uh, four things that you get to do within the world of marketing and communications and um, a little bit of a flavor of some of the stuff that I had fun doing when I was at Princess. Now I'm at Expertainment, which is my own marketing strategy consultancy. And again, feel free to link into me uh, follow me on Twitter and, and uh, the, the key is to grow your network. Any other final thoughts? I know I've pretty much used it most of the time, but I hope that was helpful, professor and, and, and class. It was outstanding, Gordon. Thank you so much. Um, I have some questions, but let's see if some students have any questions of you. This is a great opportunity to ask uh, Gordon, who's such an innovator and networker and um, great examples. So anybody want to ask a question? All right. Uh, I, can, uh, I, I can ask you one, Mr. Gordon. Um, after the, the chaos that was, um, you know, quarantining and, and having to really learn on the fly with what you guys did with the Seven Diamond, what would you take from that maybe, you know, going into future cruises and what your company's going to do? What are the big takeaways that you want to implement? I think first and foremost, I think you have to ensure the health and safety of the crew and the passengers, right? So I think that you've seen it in hotels and airlines and even the cruises when they resume, you have to have the proper protocols. In fact, the CDC has set guidelines and those have to be followed, but things will change. For example, the buffet is likely going to go away. Hmm. And instead of a buffet where you help yourself and everyone's talk, touching the same spoon or tongs, I think it's going to be either... The crew will serve you. So when you come around with your plate, they'll put something on your plate or uh, it will be all in little containers so that you grab a, a get, grab and go container. So there won't be the co-sharing of tongs and, and, and utensils. So there's going to be changes in order to reinforce safety and health, because I think the there won't be it, the new there will be a new normal, which won't be the same as what the normal was over a year ago. Here's my here's a follow up question for that. Would that be mostly in a response to how people are going to feel about going to these larger public spaces, or would it be something that's that you want to implement more just in case something happens? I think it's both. I think it's both because I think you don't want to make guests on edge. Um, if they, cause I think there's still going to be social distancing and mask wearing for some time initially. Mm -hmm. And ultimately look at, let's face it. The flu season this year was a, was a lot less severe because we're all wearing masks, right? Flu mm -hmm. was almost non-existent. And so in many ways, the, the, the hand washing wearing masks is going to make us healthier, forgetting about COVID everything else. So to the extent that we can prevent the spread of communicable diseases on a ship because of protocols, why not? Nobody likes getting sick when they're on vacation. Right. Good, good point. We yeah. Given, given some great examples, Gordon, you know, turning uh, lemons into lemonade and um, just, just great. Um, since your background is marketing and um, you went to a great, um, I guess, was it an MBA or master's at Northwestern, the Kellogg School? One of the yeah, I got, yeah, I got my MBA at, at Kellogg and then I got my undergrad in engineering at, at Stanford. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, some of our students are interested in marketing mm -hmm. and we offer a couple of marketing classes here but if truly you wanted to do what you're doing and uh, understanding uh, customers and behaviors um, would you suggest the MBA um, is probably the next step for someone that really wants to be into marketing? Yeah, I think it depends, right? A lot of people, there's some universities that offer marketing. I never majored in marketing. I was an engineer, but it, it prepared me. So I don't think, I think an, an MBA, I really enjoy my MBA, but I actually will tell people now um, that an MBA might be really good, especially if you want to pivot. Let's say you were in, a, a, you were in finance and you decided you wanted to change careers because you didn't like finance. An MBA is a great way to do a pivot. Okay. But if you already leave, let's say you go to NAU and then you, you, 
get up and do your, you're doing a good job doing social media or marketing or PR and you love it. There's no reason why you can, can't continue to progress without an MBA. So I think an MBA is a perfect example. If you feel like you need to pivot or you really are missing something, go for it. But I think nowadays it's like, I hate to say it. You can learn anything you want on YouTube now. Not, not that you aren't doing a great job, Professor Fred, with your class, but it's, it's unbelievable how you can upskill yourself with the tools available, right? But the big, but the MBA is a great environment for you to grow your network. That's a huge benefit. So I would say absolutely, it's a great program. But I would say it's just you know, plan it out, and you have to decide if it's if it's the net positives outweigh the net negatives because you are giving up a couple of years unless you can do it at night. Then you have to be very disciplined about that. But I really enjoyed my MBA. It was really helpful for me. Yeah, that's that's a, a very very good answer. I you know I see myself as a professor, kind of as a curator of really great uh, experts like yourself, and I like to introduce uh, our students and myself to new um, innovations and new fields of opportunity, and really try to open the minds of our students as to what is possible. Mm -hmm. um, for example. We all know technology is uh, with us and is going to play even more of a role in our career, whether it's hospitality, travel, or something else. And we just were approved here at NAU by the provost to offer a five course, we're calling it Hospitality Innovative Technology. It'll be a five course certificate and it include digital marketing, uh, digital revenue management, big data analytics, strategic, uh, technologies, and there'll be five courses. Excellent. Uh, our students could take it once they graduate. It's uh, eight week modules, I think the price will be good, but it'll give them a certificate from NAU in this specialty area of technology. Yeah, and I think course, that's great. In your talk today, you talk so much about uh, technology, including um, um, the Princess uh, Medallion. Yeah. Google Analytics, I mean, all of that, uh, we'll be teaching in this certificate. So they'll yeah, be a big great. announcement students and I'll make sure I send you a copy, uh, Gordon. I think that's great. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, practical, useful learning that you were talked about those five subjects, sounds great. Um, I just did a digital marketing lecture and I realize it's just, you know, for me, I have to keep up to date on it because I have a good foundation, but it's so dynamic, but that's what's so great. Those, those tools are out there. There's no shortage of, of ways for you to keep learning. And I think this, the course offered by NEU, what you just talked about, Professor, sounds great. And um, hopefully a lot of people will take advantage of it. Yeah, we're trying to stay on the leading edge, but you're absolutely right. We can give a foundation, but the change is so fluid, so rapid. And like yeah, once you put exactly, exactly, you're able That's to good. um to take uh, badges and these micro credential courses usually online, and um, so we're offering now and some of the students that are with us today, it's a um, uh, Disney leadership um, uh, course with um, uh, Lee Cockerell and Dan Cockerell They're actually teaching it every Monday evening to a pilot group of students that we've selected. And, um, you know, just talking about uh, leadership and innovation and- Excellent. I worked for Disney and like you, you know, of course safety was like the most important item, you know, standard that we had to follow. And I think the cruise industry really is a leader in, in safety. And mm -hmm. we were always before COVID. I mean, I think the ships were really pretty far in advance in terms of protocols, yeah. inspections and innovation. So. I expect but, that to continue uh, once we start cruising again. So yeah, I hope I hope so. But I think you bring up a good point about safety. Safety is something that is so critical. When you think about Disney World, right? Even then, there's things that happen, right? The uh, so my 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 old boss at Disney is the CEO now, and he was telling me like one of the hardest things he had to deal with was when you know the, the alligator uh, yeah. gra grabbed that toddler, right? That's like that stuff you just can't predict, and it, it's hard. You have to be ready for that. You have to be empathetic. And you have to then put in safeguards because inevitably something's going to happen. Like all of us are going to experience a cyber attack, 
right? It's not a matter of if, it's when and how much you can manage that cyber attack, right? And so all of you, not to be a downer to end this, but that's why I ended with crisis management because you're, all of us are going to have to deal with the positives about something that works so well. It could be, could be a great restaurant that you, you've marketed or it could be a good entertainment item, but there's going to be crisis. And I think that's why you need to look at both ends of the spectrum. And I would say prepare, 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 because when a crisis happens, if you can make it and contain it and say, hey, we contained it after two hours or 12 hours as opposed to four weeks, you know, that makes a big difference, you know. But I think that safety is so critical to your point, Professor Fred. And uh, yeah, good point. That, that's great. Thank you so much. I just, I guess the last thing I'll say, how do you um, see the cruise industry going forward once yeah. uh, we get out of this uh, pandemic? How, what is your outlook? Yeah, I think the cruise industry, I mean, when you look at their booking, they're forward booked pretty strong, right? If they, if you can look at their 22, um, it's pretty strong. And I think partially is because a lot of people have credits because a lot of their cruises were canceled, right? The past 12 months of cruises have been canceled. So uh, there's a lot of people who have rebooked the, the credit they have. But remember, the satisfaction of cruising is generally much higher than land-based cruises. And I, I talk about this, something called the summer camp effect. It's like an adult summer camp, because like if, if you're sitting next to someone, it's not strange for someone to say, hi, what's your name? Where are you from? You know, and, and, and because you're all in this ship together, it's like summer camp. And because of that, you get to meet people. And in, in case you didn't know, the key to happiness based on some Harvard research, um, Sean Aker, who wrote The Happiness Advantage, was telling me the key to happiness, one of the strongest correlations is strong social connections. The opposite of happiness is loneliness. So how do you have a vacation where you can have even stronger social connections? Cruising, you will meet people on a cruise. There's no doubt about it. Some of them you may end up finding that you keep in touch for years and years. You may even cruise together. And he actually said, cruising may quite frankly be the best type of vacation to drive happiness. And I think that addictive quality is a subtle thing that people don't talk about within cruising beyond the fact that it's efficient, right? You unpack once, you get to see multiple things. So I think that that element will bring cruising back over time, but it will take a while because um, a lot of the new cruisers are going to be a little scared. People who've never tried cruising, they've heard a lot of bad PR. That's going to take a while for that to heal but it will come back. That's great. Well, Gordon, just tremendous uh, presentation. We're so honored to have you here, uh, Professor Ho. You've done a, just a great job. We hope we can uh, bring you back. I hope our students uh, today joining us will link in with you.